gather part seven. Can you believe it? We're going to continue to gather, and I thank you for continuing to gather here together. Does that slide look good? It looks good. I love that. Thank you, Dave. Today we, we start another segment of it, though. Part seven begins a different topic a little bit. Last week we talked about the five core doctrines. Five core doctrines. And depending on the list that you look at, it may be broken up into a few other segments. I just kind of summed it up in five. And these would be the primary doctrines that comprise the faith. You cannot rightly call yourself a Christian biblically and truthfully if you don't hold to the five primary doctrines. And we had those up there. And if you remember last week, we have the fact, uh, the nature of God or, and the fact that he's a trinity. That's essential for the historic Christian faith. And it's essential for you and I if we claim to be Christians. We can't deny that aspect or the other aspects that the Bible teaches us about God's nature. Now, someone might have suggested that my point number five, the authority of Scripture, should have been point number one. Once again, uh, I'm with you on all of that. However you want to organize these doctrines, these are the primary doctrines that define the Christian faith, the deity of Jesus Christ, his person, and all that the Bible says that he is. We've got to be together on that, or we've got big problems. Number three, the second coming, the fact that he is coming bodily back to this planet. Now, we can talk about, secondarily, the timing of the rapture and things of that nature. We're going to look at that this morning. But the second coming is vital. He is coming back. Amen? Amen. All true Christians believe that. And we hold to that. And we anticipate that. Four, salvation, which comprises a lot of issues and a lot of doctrines and a lot of teachings. But it's, you know, whittled down by grace through faith in Christ alone. All of these things, not of, our, not of ourselves, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Listen, it's core that you understand the gospel and what it means and what the Bible teaches about what we need to believe and trust in in order to have salvation. Amen? How many of you are joyful and can say, yes, by grace I've been saved? This is good stuff. We have to unite around this. The church is always united around this. And verse 5, scriptural authority. Again, this is my list with my order, and all of it's important because all of these doctrines build upon one another. And, of course, Scripture is our authority as the basis and the source for these doctrines. Do you rejoice in that this morning? I do. There's your standard. And it really isn't a difficult concept to get our heads around that, that God has spoken and it's authoritative for our life in all matters of faith and practice. The Bible must be the bedrock that teaches us these things that we hold to. Now, I want to remind you, Spurgeon once said, he's the only Calvinist I quote, by the way, and I give a disclaimer about Calvinism, but that's another issue. For another day, but Spurgeon said a brilliant statement: "A man can know all the doctrines of the Bible and not know Christ." So there's a reminder as we can continue to proceed. I'm real heavy, and we're real heavy here talking about doctrine, doctrine, doctrine. These are important because they encapsulate the truths that God revealed to us. But it is possible to be a theologian or a scholar of what the biblical material might say and completely miss that it's about Jesus and not have a relationship with Christ. There's a danger there. We're not all head knowledge. We're not all sitting here going, you better nail down the finest points of all of these things. Well, you better have that relationship with Jesus. And without the Holy Spirit, by the way, you're not going to be able to comprehend or really understand the truth behind what these statements say up here. But do we understand that we are united together in true unity? When Jesus said, make them one, Father, in John 17, he meant it. And we are one in Jesus this morning. Listen, we might go to churches with different names on the front sign, but God knows who are his the world over. And there are many people on this planet right at this hour who truly belong to him and are in the family of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And to those who believed in him, John said that he gave them the right to become the sons of God. This is exciting stuff. We are in unity with the body of Christ who is truly saved at this very hour, no matter where in the world we are. Isn't that exciting? That's awesome. 
Now we look out and we see all these divisions and all these things, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about the basis for that here this morning, and we're going we're to take our time on this because we're not going to get to the, all of the, the things here, but these doctrines are core, and they are accompanied by many other true teachings. It's not limited to these five as I have it listed, but let me tell you, this is where you start. Otherwise, and this could be called, in, in, in manner of speaking, and some theologians call it this, the mere Christianity situation, meaning that this is the basic, lowest common denominator uh, factors of unity that you can be a Christian. And then there's all kinds of other issues that we see spill into that and are connected to those things. So I want to say, first of all, as well, that all doctrine is important. Jesus said, thy word is truth, speaking of the scriptures. And so the Bible is our guide. And so we should endeavor to be faithful biblically in all areas of doctrine. Amen. Even the side issues or secondary issues as they've been called. And I want to just emphasize as I read a list of secondary issues this morning that this doesn't cover all of it either. And that as I read these secondary issues here that we have, we understand something. True believers in all walks of life, in all backgrounds, in all geographical locations on this planet and for many, many years throughout church history have stood in different areas on these subjects and yet they're true believers you're going to be in heaven someday with people that you did not agree with here on earth and they're going to look at you and think the same thing what are you doing here or wow you know the, the, the people that you expect might not be there might come up and you'll be pleasantly surprised for eternity listen this is going to be an exciting time when we all get together and all the fighting's done and all the, 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 the dialoguing and the debating. But I want to tell you these eight, is that eight? No, there's more than eight anyway. But these right here are things that we can vigorously discuss. And it shouldn't be animosity. It shouldn't be anger over these issues. I want to emphasize a few things in this week and the next week that this is, these are issues that are debated hotly even in the church today. I have no hope as a single individual of settling some of these debates in church history. I will pro propose a biblical perspective on it and ask you to do what the Bible tells us to do, and that is test all things. But I want to emphasize even the secondary doctrines are important. Don't hear me this morning say, well, as long as you got the five or the eight or the seven or whatever, whatever categories in the primaries, well, that's all you need. No, you know what? We need to continually apprehend the truth of the Scripture on every area. Wouldn't you agree? And we'll talk about the basis for division here for a moment. But all doctrine is important, but these are some secondary issues. Saints can still be saints and disagree in these areas. I'll demonstrate that for you today. Here's a list, though. Let's look at them together. I just put at the top of the list because we're going to try to deal with that one here this morning. Eschatology, the study of end times. I mean, we all know there's only one interpretation that everybody believes about the end times, right? I mean, there's no debate or controversy over that. No, that's absolutely a hot topic right now. A hot topic. Read John's comments for his prophecy update every day. You'll see every shade of belief and opinion and all these other things. Well, listen, somebody's wrong. Could I, could I assert that this morning? Somebody out of all of us is wrong. On whatever side of the issue, I think all of us are, gonna, again, going to discover and see that there was a great deal of mystery as far as the depths of all of these issues, primary, secondary, whatever you want to label them. But it uh, does matter where you stand on this because it will affect, at some point, it will touch a primary doctrine. And so that's why I'm telling you this morning, I really believe that these are important to arrive at a biblical assessment and understanding of these things another one eternal versus conditional security now some of you might go well that's an essential that you can't you cannot compromise on that why this is my position on what that is and and we're going to talk about that i'm just telling you it's debated and many consider it a secondary issue yes there's salvation by grace through faith alone but is it eternal from the get-go and somebody can't lose it or you know how this debate goes am i right Look at verse 3, or number 3, water baptism methods. 
This is fun. For Grace Brethren people, this is really fun to talk about, okay? Well, we'll talk about that. Communion practices. How many of you know there's only one way to do communion, right? No. Think about it. Bible versions. We're going to talk a little bit about that at some point. Continuationism versus cessationism. And I know what all, that all of you know what that means. It means, do spiritual gifts continue from the time which they were given to the church initially? Is it in effect today? That would be continuationism, and there's other nuances to it. But cessationism means that certain gifts, or all the gifts, depending on what, where you stand on that, have ceased in the church today. So we don't have tongues, prophecy, word of knowledge, etc. in the church today. Well, we're going to talk about that. That's a hotly debated issue. And you might have friends that stand on other sides of that, but you know that you're going to be in heaven with them someday. You see how that's different than somebody who would deny the Trinity? We can talk all day about whether you think the gifts are in effect today or not, or which ones are and which ones aren't. And we will talk about it, and we should talk about it as Christians but all of us should be endeavoring to know why we believe the perspective we do. Angelology issues. You want to get weird? Ask me what I think about angels and the sons of God and some of these things. And there's people that go, well, man, you have gone bonkers, man. And I'm like, that's okay. Let's talk about how bonkers I am and why that's the case. And I'm going to explain to you why I would land on certain issues of angelology. That's just one. Additional issues, a real small one, Calvinism, right? No big deal. Oh, my goodness, that's huge. And I want to say that definitely touches on some of the primary doctrines of salvation. Do not hear me say otherwise. I am actually wrestling as to whether I believe the gospel of Calvinism, according to Calvin and the Reformers, is indeed another gospel or not. That's serious business. I'm a student of these things. I'm in process with all of these things. Can I, can I say that? But you're going to hear some disclosure today about what your pastor thinks about a few things. And I'll tell you why I'm doing that, because some of you have specifically asked me where I land on some of these issues. And I'm not telling you at all. No, I'm going to try to articulate why I would land where I land. But I ask that you give me grace and understanding, just like we ought to be doing with one another and with our friends and family who land different on these issues. Arminianism, the other side there of Calvinism, were the answer, you know, the five points that Calvinism answers. We'll get into that someday. Music preferences. We all love rock and roll, right? Church government. Churches are governed in different ways, but does it mean those people are going to hell if they don't do it the way that we do it? No, it doesn't. Where there's room for dialogue and even some debate on this stuff. Liberty issues, what's okay and what's not okay for a Christian to do. Personal convictions, things of that nature. All I wanted to do to demonstrate this is there's a lot involved that is taught in Scripture and referenced in Scripture, and there are issues that we must endeavor to arrive at the most biblical stance that we can on. Would you agree with me this morning as we go forward that it is important to be biblical in every area, including what we would call secondary issues this morning? So let's chart the course here. These and other issues have been and continue to be hotly debated and vigorously dialogued about among believers in church history all the way until now, and good Christians reside on both issues. But I think the conversations are getting a bit volatile out there, if you ask me. And so this is part of the purpose of why we're charting a little course in this area. We're going to look briefly at these different lists that I have over the next few weeks. We're also going to look briefly at our own statement of faith as written on our website, which represents some basic beliefs of our church. And I want to reemphasize what I did last week, that I'm so grateful for those who hammered that thing out. Mike, John, a number of y'all really worked together to put together a statement of faith that I believe is faithful to Scripture. Is it perfect? Is it completely comprehensive in every issue that, the, that is ever going to come up in Christian life and practice and body life here at the church? No, but it's a wonderful starting point, and I'm going to continue to uphold that and, and, and stand by it insofar as it is directly coming from Scripture. We will look at and discuss our stance as a church versus my stance on a few issues. Uh-oh. What does that mean? 
Well, we're going to talk about it. But as we begin, I want to urge you, study these areas. No one of us is an expert or have mastered any of these areas, including the core doctrines in our life. This is a lifelong pursuit, people. And if you get it now in your heart and in your mind to say, I'm going to just absorb what the Scriptures say. I'm going to dive in. I'm going to learn why I believe what I believe. Devote yourself to prayer in this and allow the Holy Spirit to minister and teach you in accord with the Word of God. And we will attempt to arrive, each of us, at the most biblical understanding, realizing there are certain subjects that are mysterious in their depth. You and I will never arrive at fully understanding and comprehending with this finite mind an eternal God who is a triune God. And you add a lot of these, all of this here has some mystery to it. That's why we worship God. We thank Him. He's just way too big for us to quantify into a box. And that's exciting to me. So that's why the study of Scripture never grows old because it's living and powerful and it's established for eternity in the heavens and it will reverberate in its truth throughout the eternal order when we go to be with the Lord. Isn't that great? But we also strive to be gentle and charitable and gracious to all people. We acknowledge that there are differences and distinctions. We don't ignore that. And today, here's a little bit of disclosure in the time that we have left. I realize this is a little different sermon because I had to give this intro to kind of give us all the points. Is that okay? Usually I'm reading 50 passages of Scripture. Look, we're going to get into that, but we need to do this house cl- housekeeping first, if you will. Um, let's talk about the first issue of eschatology this morning because I thought, look, if you all can get through this one and I still have a job, then we're good. Um, if we can get through this one and not lose the four people that watch me online, then we're good too. Because I think we ought to be able to have a different opinion on aspects of eschatology and end times. Now, I'm already convinced that I'm right, but I'm allowing you guys to be wrong. It's okay. It's fine. Just joking. Nobody's laughing. That wasn't a joke. That was good. Here's where we land as a church. And the reason I'm, at, I'm telling you this, at least fundamentally, if you were to go to our statement of faith, you would read the following. This is from the FBC statement of faith. So blame the guys who wrote it if you don't agree with it. No, I'm excited about it. Here's what it says. And it's very concise. The return of Christ, under that section, we believe that Christ will come for his church before the day of the Lord. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. Love it. And there's references there that we're going to read here in a second. Then, after the 70th week of Daniel, according to Daniel 9.27, he will usher in the millennium when Satan will be bound and Christ's rule will be supreme for 1,000 years, according to Revelation 20, verses 1 through 6. The white throne judgment of sinners will follow the millennium, Revelations 20, verse 7 through 15. Now, if you just take those statements there with the verse references provided, you have a glorious framework that takes the Bible for what it says. And I love that about this church. We have a position on this. There is an official FBC position. If some of you come up to me and continue to ask me, what do we believe about dot, 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 I will tell you, go to the statement of faith first and see what we believe about it. But there's things on there that are not articulated that some of us individually have arrived at, some convictions that we have from the further study of Scripture, and and the statement of faith is not designed to address absolutely every aspect of all of those powerful teachings. But let's read these first two. Go with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14 through 18. And you know what? Second coming was part of uh, what I consider to be primary doctrines. And this is where we stand from these two passages as a church. Now, you as an individual also, though, must embark on your own journey in the Scriptures to see if these things are so. Like the Bereans. We're asserting, and I say we, I I have the leadership of this church backing me up on these two passages right here. But we're at various levels of conviction of a few other nuances of this, which would be a secondary situation. 
But primarily, can we read these two together? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And I hope I have the right thing here. I, I mean, uh, what is it? Uh, verse 14. Yes, yeah, starting in verse 14. <clears throat> For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Amen? Isn't that great? Rapture's coming. He's coming back, folks. And when we talk about the second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as the Son of David, we believe that He will bodily return to the earth, but preceded by a return in the clouds. It's one event, the parousia, the coming of Christ, but in two phases, some would say, and some would subdivide it. A rapture preceding the actual arrival of His feet set down on the earth, and He reigns for a thousand years. Do you doubt that this morning from what we just read from Paul? No, but study it. Get familiar with it and look at all the other passages that confirm that. Go with me to a hot-button passage, 2 Thessalonians. If you thought Paul was, uh, was on to something in 1 Thessalonians, he was. But 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1-4, through 4, Pastor Mike has shared on this recently. I would, I would refer anybody to go back to the last time he was in this pulpit a few weeks ago sharing from this passage. Here's what we also have in our statement of faith that we believe about the second coming. Look at verse 1 through 4. Now we request you, brethren, Paul writes, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. That's the rapture, folks. There's no other way to look at that. Okay? Very clear. I'm just saying... This is what it says, right? That you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you for it will not come unless two things. The apostasy, which is not the rapture. Okay, It's the falling away, not the catching away. Don't get it twisted, because that's a theory floating around out of desperation. It will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. If you don't know who that is, verse 4 says, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Folks, the Thessalonians are worried that they missed the rapture. They missed the, the, the gathering in the air with their loved ones. And he says it will not happen until two things happen first. The falling away and the revelation of the man of sin. Now that doesn't quite square with some of the pre-tribulational beliefs that many of us sat under. Notice in our statement of faith, what does it not say? The word pre-tribulational doesn't say it. Doesn't mean that some of you in this church don't believe it and are going to continue to hold to it. It doesn't mean either that there aren't people in here who are trying to process how to be the most biblical in terms of what Scripture says as opposed to some of the things we've been taught. Am I getting in trouble yet? Yeah. Talk to Mike. Talk to me. <laughs> this is disclosure of where your pastor's at right now. I was raised imminent, pre-tribulation, rapture. Premillennial, dispensationalist, of which I am still premillennial, but I am not strictly a dispensationalist, and we'll get into that terminology later, okay? But do you see how this thing goes? we got to figure this out. You have to figure this out. The Bible teaches a perspective, and we have to come to the Scriptures and 
humbly submit our ideas, our opinions, what we've been taught, what we've sat and listened to our whole life, what others around us are so firmly convicted of, it's all got to be tested by the Scripture. You and I are not exempt from being students of God's Word to try to best interpret and understand what He is communicating to us about even things like, as we're talking about right now, eschatology, the end times. Let me show you why this gets sticky. We're going to have to close here in a moment. Dave, could we play the video clip? I have a three-minute video clip from back in 2017. And before he plays that, I want to preface it by saying this. Jan Markell and Understand the Times is a ministry that is very prominent about pre-tribulational teachings. They believe only in what they have dubbed the blessed hope of the pre-tribulation rapture. You will hear them say that statement over and over and over and over and over again, even though it is not actually a statement lifted from the pages of Scripture because we have no Scripture that comes out and uses the term pre-tribulation or uses that as a definer for any kind of timing of the rapture. It is a theory. It is a concept derived from taking out of certain verses and hints and suggestions that we've formulated, as many in the church have formulated, what is called pre-tribulationism. But there's no explicit statement of the timing of the rapture. Do you understand? Unless, of course, we would take what Paul actually said that we just read in 2 Thessalonians. It will not happen before at least two things come to pass in a very explicit way. And then we get deeper into the day of the Lord thing, which again, see Mike, okay? And come here for our conference in October with Charles Cooper and Mr. Kirshner. They are going to bring a scriptural presentation about these things. And it will be good, it will be eloquent, it will be fervent, it will be straightforward for your serious consideration. And I'm excited about it. Now, Jan Markell is interviewing her co-hosts, her companions, J.D. Farag from Hawaii, right? Connie Ohoy, the other side of the island. Boo. No, I'm just joking. I love, I, love, I love the fact he's from Hawaii, and I want to eat a plate lunch with that guy. And anybody listening locally right now knows exactly what I just said. I have zero Ill, Ill will towards this man, although I disagree with him in this area. You will see Amir Sarfati sitting there from Behold Israel, who I also happen to have enjoyed a great deal of what he teaches and his love for the land and the Jewish people. I love both him and J.D. for that, and I believe these guys are brothers in the Lord. Am I being clear? When I do this, you know I'm, in, I'm, I'm, cons I'm weighing what to say. I'm going to play a clip for you that, to me, I'm going to tell you I'm adamantly opposed to how it's being talked about, the rhetoric being used. And I'll explain after we hear this three-minute clip of them talking in 2017. Dave, if you'd like to play that for us, please. Listen um, closely. To both of you, and Pastor J.D. is going to be speaking on the rapture here at this event. Um, free trip is under attack, simple as it can be. You talk, look, you call it satanic attack. I think that's totally, that's totally appropriate. But, you know, when we say that, J.D., we make some people so mad. Because, it, I mean, they can't, they can't understand why we would say it's a satanic attack. Right. To me, uh, it is satanic because of the effect that it has when you uh, have such confusion from the author of confusion. Oh, yeah. You have accusation from the accuser of the brethren, and you have lies from the father of lies. And it just creates such a confusion. I had an interesting uh, comment from someone recently. They said, why don't you teach the other views? Mm -hmm. You know, um, I heard it said this way, just real quickly. The way they would train bank tellers to spot a counterfeit is to have them so familiar with the genuine, where they touch it, they feel it, they count it, they smell it, and then they'll insert a counterfeit bill, and they know, wait a minute, 
that's not right. I was listening to a, a, a guy on TV. I never do this in, in, in the hotel. When I'll get this channel in Hawaii. Uh, and I was watching this guy, and within five seconds, I thought, oh, my goodness, is this what people are watching? This, is, this isn't the gospel. It's like the Apostle Paul mm. says. It's a different gospel, which is no gospel at all. Mm. I'm building on what you just said. You, you're asked sometimes to maybe preach on the other ver the other interpretations of the radio. I'm asked to do radio all the time. Or mm -hmm. I'm getting email all the time. Why don't you do a program explaining what the pre wrath rapture is? You, all of them. Uh, I, I don't want to confuse people with nonsense. I hate to be so blunt. <laughs> Okay, that'd be that <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> I always ask people, how do you want to get to heaven? Rare, medium, yeah. well, medium well, or well done? There you go. And that's basically, what do you want me to teach? Yeah. Uh, that, that you're going to be half dead, or you're going to be headless when yeah, you get there? Exactly. <laughs> I mean, so, I mean, knowing that we're you know, not destined to the wrath of God, and that he will pull us or take us out of, not through the hour of trial, I, I just don't see how we can teach anything else. Okay. Now, notice my tone right now. It's subdued, am I right? Yeah. And it needs to stay that way when I talk about this issue because I'll tell you why. These people represent a massive section of the body of Christ that believes 100% the way they do. That there's only pre-tribulation teaching. That's the only acceptable, biblical, non-satanic, if you will, form of believing about the end times. Again, he attempt now Amir's comment at the end was just kind of silly about, you know, how do you want to get to, that's that's irrelevant. It's it's really what does the Bible teach about when the rapture could happen and is there a fact that people who hold a different view than just the pre tribulational view that this team upholds? And I bring this to you because I know a lot of you listen to this. I know a lot of you like Understand the Times. And there was a time where Understand the Times liked us as Fellowship Bible Chapel. And she would actually recommend the Prophecy Update from here. Those days are gone. There has been a militance that has arisen in that camp. And I want to grant two things to them. Number one, I know they have had people come against them in vicious, horrible ways. And I think this is a reaction to that. Can I be honest? I think that's a lot, lot what this is. What they have witnessed from some people who don't hold a pre-tribulational view could be satanic in terms of its level of anger and how they've come against them. I get it. I get it. But that rhetoric that J.D. Farag is spreading and this platform that she's giving to that, oh, you, you could tell even by her mannerisms that, they were, that, that she was hesitant to go there with this issue. Could you see that? Oh, I know we're going to get in trouble. Oh, yeah, oh, you know. And I'm like that. That's me. That's what I just did before I brought this whole segment up. Did you, did you catch that this morning? I was up here going, I'm going to weigh what I'm about to say. She has to do that too, and I get it. They are fervent about the pre-tribulation rapture. Now that camp, each one of those individuals there with their ministries has some serious problems. They do. And you know what? We have issues. But to say that there's a satanic attack on the pre-trib rapture, followed by the old Calvary Chapel example, I call it the Calvary Chapel one because this is where I first heard of the apologetics, the, the counterfeit money thing, so that anything that's not pre-tribulational and, and in their term, the blessed hope of the pre-tribulation rapture is, quote, nonsense. That was said there. It's all nonsense. It's a satanic attack. So that puts you in the category, if you're not a pre-tribulational person, you're a tool of the devil, is what that infers. It's rhetoric, but it's, it's, it's inflammatory. By nature, it ups the discussion that we should be able to have about a difference of opinion in this non-essential, if you will. It, it ups it to where it's, it's our way or satanic. Did you catch that? That's why I played this clip, because this has bothered me for two years. Because the way that it was talked about makes it look like any questioning of their version, by the way, because there's a lot of dissension in that camp. There's a lot of disagreement. There's a lot of difference of opinion. And you know what? That's okay. It's a secondary issue. We can, we can wrestle with these things. Amen? I'm wrestling. I'm a wrestler, man. 
Now, I might be assertive up here because I get confident in something I study, and I go, man, this is, yeah, you know, I, I go for it. And I get it. But i got to be careful with my terminology when dealing with this. The rapture, my friends, is the essential position that he is returning in the air for his saints. But in, 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 in the timing issues, we have people of pre-trib camp, meaning before the seven years. We have a mid-trib situation, including intraseal and sort of a pre-wrath. And you have post-trib. Now, I think post-tribbers are out to lunch, baby, in that area. But I say that with a jovial heart. I'm not going to say they're satanic. Do you understand? If, you hold, if, you're, if you've not arrived yet at what my position is, the, you know what? We need to have grace with one another. I don't call you satanic if you have a different opinion of the timing of the rapture. I would ask that you don't call me satanic if I have a different opinion of the timing of the rapture. So that clip, though, is so important to me because it really set a tone for the discussions after that. And granted, people on all sides need to take a chill pill and relax. Okay, seriously. You don't need to get all up in arms about it. Uh, last week I said that I was going to be talking about secondary issues this week, and I already had somebody go on my YouTube thing and say, well, if he, as long as he doesn't talk about pre-trib, eternal security, and, and, and one other thing, then otherwise I'm not watching anymore. And I'm like, so what if I want to talk about that? I mean, don't get me wrong, if you don't watch, I'm not going to lay awake at night, but I'm bummed out that people are so, before I even said anything about this, have already determined in their mind, well, he's of that camp. You're of that camp. You're of this camp. You're of that camp. You know what? I say, yeah, we're of different camps. Let's get together around the campfire and talk about some of this stuff. Amen? That's what I'm doing this morning. That's all I'm doing. So I didn't play this clip to poke a snake or to get them all riled up. But I did want to demonstrate that that's the mentality. And I have a few other links on today's sermon. If you go on the, the YouTube, and you, you can click on a few other segments from those ministries that talk about it. You know, essentially, one of them seems to lay this out as pre-trib as a salvation issue. And that gets a little dangerous. But that's why you say something like that, that it's satanic. And then you say, we're not going to talk about any other position we're not going to have an open dialogue these people will not dialogue or even debate uh, in a friendly manner some people that have asked them to do that they say an awful lot about this and again they've redefined a term in the bible the blessed hope my friends the blessed hope is the return of christ it's the person that's coming back it's not specific to a, a particular time of the rapture, although, can I say, there will be a particular time to the rapture. And some of us might be wrong in what we've figured out at this point. But that's what I want to endeavor to encourage you to do. We're going to have to close here in a few minutes. You want to hear some disclosure? Your pastor here, me, speaking for myself, I am not any longer an adherent to imminent pre-tribulationism. Now, I don't have time to explain dispensationalism, but I could also tell you I agree with some tenets of that aspect, including a difference between Israel and the church. And there's scriptures on our sermon today for you to look at, at, at why, where I land on that and where I don't land on that. And I want to assure you, though, I've arrived at not believing in the imminent return like I was raised to believe and not believing in a strict pre-tribulational viewpoint through what Scripture says, not what my favorite teacher has said or teachers. I glean from a lot of people, including those who do not land the way that I have currently landed in terms of my belief. But I am premillennial, meaning that Jesus will return to earth and I do love how our statement of faith leaves room when it says, before the day of the Lord, the rapture will occur. Because that means if you're a pre-trib or a mid-trib, you can come here and we can fellowship together and work out that issue. Amen? Do you understand? Is that, Mike, is that a fair statement about what, what that says? Now, somebody's right. Somebody's more right than the other position. And I would have to say at this point, after having studied it for myself and continuing to do so, I do not believe in 
what I was brought up to believe the imminent return of a pre-tribulational rapture. So, can we, is that okay, disclosure? Now, if you want to talk to me about that, that's what I invite you to do. And that's what this morning is about. And for all of our friends online who are now doing the little click log off thing, I love you and I would rather you stay on and we talk about why deeper that I've arrived at that position. And I realize this morning I'm not, I'm not giving you enough to understand the underpinnings of that, but I'll just cite Second Thessalonians 2 and say, read that. And what does it say? There's something there that doesn't jive with pre-tribulational teaching. And I'm not even getting into the origins of it and the people who are doing stuff. Uh, to end this morning, though, because we are out of time, uh, I'd like you to go to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Uh, as we go there in closing, uh, I am aware that Bill read that this morning, which I thought was great. Uh, so it's a double emphasis. I think the Lord's in that. But hear me. I want to really submit my tone and my convictions to the Lord. And I want, to, I want you to hear me with all the love in my heart that I have no ill will on any personal nature on any of the people that I just played that clip from. I believe they're my brothers and sister in Christ. If, you know, that's what all pans out in the end here when God knows who's his and all this stuff. I don't like being lumped into a category now that would, that would be described in any way as somebody who holds a belief that is a tool of the devil to attack the only true interpretation of a secondary issue. So I played that. Because I want you to know that's the tenor of the discussion. I want to encourage you to come and see our speakers in October because they're going to present a pre-wrath position, which is a mid-trib scenario. And I love what Charles Cooper said online. I've watched a couple of their sermons. Tune into these guys. Uh, Je uh, uh, blank. Kirsch Kirshner? Alan Kirshner, thank you, and Charles Cooper. Google those guys and watch Charles Cooper, who I absolutely adore. Just his mannerisms are great too, but I like, he, he said something in one of his sermons and he goes, uh, I'm, I'm fighting to do an impression and I can't do it. But he, it, something in a very smooth way, he said something like, we're endeavoring to, uh, oh, this is terrible, I'm not going to master it. We're endeavoring to find out, to, to, to see which viewpoint reconciles best the clear teachings of the Scripture. It's not about the opinion of your favorite teacher or what you heard growing up or what study tape you, you happened to cross in college or something. It is about what does the Bible say, and which view is the most faithful to the clear teachings of Scripture? There's my challenge to you. That will be presented in October in a way way better than, than I'm doing here or could do. But I'm, I'm studying Scripture, and I'm on a mission. I want to get as biblical as I can about what to expect in these days. We'll talk a little bit next week about the price that you pay if we're wrong on these issues, because there is one. And it does affect other things. But Titus 2 says it all as we close. Verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. And he's referencing this and other concepts in chapter 2 and chapter 1. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Folks, that's where it's at. The blessed hope and the appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Where we land on these issues does determine what we believe and how we live. And my encouragement to you is embark on that adventure.
to discover what the Bible has been revealing to us all along and try to find the best way to reconcile the truths of Scripture and conform your viewpoint to that. And if you do, you'll also see lots of passages in there about why I'm concerned about the rhetoric of calling someone else's position on a secondary issue satanic or absolute nonsense and dismissed without even addressing. We need to be open to talking about these things and discussing and even friendly, gracious debate. Amen? Father, thank you for your word. We're out of time this morning, but... You're never out of time. You're outside of time, and we love you for it. And we know that on our end here on the earth, we just have had such wonderful gifts from your hand. And Lord, we will, no matter what, say, blessed be your name, no matter if you give or you take away, because you have the right to do so. And you love us so much that not one of us in here could say you have not been faithful at all times in our life. Thank you. And thank you for the truths of Scripture. And for primary, secondary, tertiary, and on down issues that we can arrive at a biblical understanding of and live our lives accordingly. Thank you for these saints who have gathered this morning. And again, may your face shine and be lifted up upon all of us. In Jesus' name. Thank you.